Okay, everyone. I just love hitting record right after AP has told a joke. <laughs> and but, I'm laughing at my own joke. That's yeah, the which thing. is entirely appropriate. But we are back. We are back with the Malazan series. This is the non-spoiler discussion of Dust of Dreams, book nine in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. So I am just absolutely over the moon. There's your copy. Ooh, nice. That's my 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 reading copy with you know, stuff in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But your fancy copy is somewhere on the shelf there, which I will drool over. And uh, 50 deposit probably... box in Zurich. <laughs> <laughs> Safe away from grubby paws like mine. But uh but no, it is so fantastic to see you, AP, and not only to see you, but to see you here looking like yourself, looking well and ready to discuss Dust of Dreams. Well, Philip, it is it is brilliant to be back. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for not only your patience, but your, your viewers' patience. I, I have been unwell. I haven't been able to read. It has been entirely my fault. This has been delayed. And it just it's unfortunate. Life happens. And I am very, very sorry. But I am so glad now that we, we get the opportunity to talk about this because it has thrown my entire plans for the year have gone into disarray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, it's not your fault. Uh, you got migraines and so you shouldn't even feel apologetic. But, uh, you know, if uh, you want to feel better, I can give you a little absolution, you know. <laughs> so abracadabra, Kalamazoo, all your naughtiness is gone. On the count of one, two. There, you feel better now? <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, yes, folks, we are here to talk about Dust of Dreams, the non-spoiler discussion, uh, which is something people can watch before reading Dust of Dreams. And today we're going to be talking about the structure and the themes that are present in this remarkable book the ninth book in the series. And then later on, we will have a spoiler-filled discussion, which will appear on AP's channel, A Critical Dragon. And that's where we, we get out all the spoilers and have a ton of fun. So, uh, and that, of course, is what, one you'd want to watch after reading Dust of Dreams. So, Well, actually, now, interestingly enough, there is research that shows being spoiled about the ending of a story actually for the majority of people enhances their enjoyment of reading. So people can come to the channel, watch the spoiler thing even before reading the book. It's, it's good for you. It'll make you enjoy the book more. There we go. We have to spread <laughs> that word on <laughs> all over YouTube. <laughs> uh, something tells me it would be greeted as something of a sacrilege, but, uh, but hey, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there is something to that. And hopefully people will get a lot out of these discussions. So let's start with the structure, something that I know you'll enjoy discussing. And always, it seems like every single book in the series, the Malazan Book of the Fallen, does something a little bit of its own when it comes to structure. And when we get to the end of the series here, Erickson does a, a you know, does an Erickson and <laughs> gives us a, a kind of a two-parter, doesn't he? Uh, so let's talk about that for a bit. And I think you had some really interesting insights in terms of the building of atmosphere as a result of this being a part one. So what do, what do you want to say about the structure? I, interesting, maybe overselling it a bit. I find <laughs> it interesting, whether anyone else does. But as, as you said, every book in the series thus far has played with the format of a novel. What is mm -hmm. a novel? How should a novel be structured? Yeah. And the thing is, we... In the modern day, particularly in modern genre writing, quite often we have an expectation about a chronological sequence of events with a core group of characters. All of those events are causally linked and they move through them in a sequence. And usually, quite often, we find the sequence is very reminiscent of, if not a direct use of, Freytag's Pyramid introduction, instigating event, rising action, climax, falling action, denouement. That's, that's the structure. And all of the books of the Malazan Book of the Fallen do different things. They, 
each one is unique in how it's approaching what Erickson wanted to do with the novel and what he was playing with. Sometimes it's splitting POVs across geographical locations to provide a sort of uh, mirroring effect. Sometimes it's the first section will be a single point of view and then the rest will be split over multiple POVs. Sometimes it's I'm going to put a climax near the beginning a, and a climax near the end, but do them differently. Sometimes I'm going to have an anti-climax and do something that is emotive and uh, resonant in that form of closure, but is not going to be the expected big battle. All of these things are different ways of exploring how the structure can impact reading. Yeah. With this book, and I think it's the only one where Erickson upfront says, this is the first half of a single huge novel. Yep. Now, this might seem really strange because, you know, we both held up, here's our, it's a big book, here's our book. And you go, oh, but it still has to follow the structure of a novel. And you go, well, you and I both know The Lord of the Rings. How many books is The Lord of the Rings? Oh, well, if you were to ask Tolkien, he would say one. <laughs> Tolkien would say one. The yeah. internal division is six. Yeah. But the printed volumes are three. So yeah. what is it? Is it a single book? Is it six books? Is it three books? Yeah. And if you start looking at the structures that Tolkien was employing with the different sections within The Lord of the Rings as a single narrative, yeah. when you look yeah. at the structures of the narrative and what he was doing, it, it doesn't neatly follow Freytag's pyramid, but right. he thought of it as a single self-contained narrative. Now, in, we are also familiar with the concept, so that the idea of a trilogy, a trilogy of novels, three separate individual instances that combine together to form an arching narrative. You also have a duology, two books that they are both complete narratives in and of themselves, mm -hmm. uh, in and of themselves. But when you combine them, they form a greater narrative. We have this concept, even with series where you go, there are 10 books in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, which is an overarching 10 book narrative, but there are individual sections. This, yeah. the uh, Dust of Dreams, is the first half of a single narrative. So it, combined with The Crippled God, is meant to be read as a single narrative. And obviously, Erickson put that note in because when this was published, and this is the thing people forget, because you go, well, why didn't you just buy both of them and read them through at the same time? Yeah, you go, yeah. When it was published, he hadn't written The Crippled God yet. Right, right. Right. So he needed to warn people if they went in with the expectation that this was going to follow a structure that was going to be, you know, what you expect with a novel, then that could lead to disappointment when you got to the end. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want people to, you know, feel let down that he didn't know what he was doing. He was like, I'm really sorry, but I can't publish this giant thing as a single volume. There's no physical way to do it. Right. But this is what he wanted to do with this story. And so in terms of structure, if we think of that very basic outline from Freytag that I was talking about, a lot of what is happening in this book is almost a, an extension of what the introduction is. This is the introduction, an instigating event and the beginning, say, of the rising action, and then is going to build to a climax, really, in the next book, and then the, the falling action into Numa. That's kind of the promise of this. Right. And because of that, it leads to a certain impression about pacing, what we experience in terms of pacing as we read, that the first part of this book or certain aspects of this book, Michael, it felt slow. And you, but if this is the introduction to a story, to a single narrative, that's usually where you take some time, where you're exploring these things, where you're introducing these things and establishing them. Yeah. And that, I think, is one of the points to bear in mind, because that sets up, and as we've talked about with all of these books, big themes that are being set up to be explored. Yeah. And it sets up the tensions that are being built on for this climax in a subsequent uh, volume right and those things need to be established or at least in Erickson's mind when he was writing it he goes I need to establish these things and 
whether or not we as readers read it and agree with them, we are always free to disagree with authors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think that is his his rationale for why he approached it this way. Right. And I think the the buildup of atmosphere and tension, which we see um, at the beginning with a, a spectacular magical event, but also the introduction and development of certain threads right. as right. they run through that feel that they are building towards something. And it is a rise in tension. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting because in an earlier book, The Bone Hunters, book six of the series, Erickson has remarked that it's really two books in one. And here we have one story in two books. So, you know, he's always playing with structure in one way or another. And you made a video uh, that came out actually today, today, the day where we're recording this, uh, which I thought was a brilliant video about the uh, part of the prologue to the Dust of Dreams. And it really got me thinking about storytelling and how storytelling is done and the idea of imposing patterns on the experiences that people have uh, on the, uh, and Erickson phrased it so beautifully in, in the uh, prologue, uh, in the imposition of, this is not a quote, but he, he talked about the idea of uh, images that uh, tear through us, right? So the imposition of patterns on these images that tear through us. Uh, what a wonderful way to think of not only this book and the construction of it, but also the idea of storytelling in general. Uh, I just thought that was a really uh, great thing that he sets up there and you explained it so beautifully. Uh, so everybody, if you haven't seen that video and, and it's not really a, a spoiler filled video, you can watch that video without having even read the prologue, I think, because uh, you, you uh, didn't well, avoid... I, oh, I, I actually, st I structured it so that that whole point, the, the talk about the patterns thing, yeah, that is all absolutely spoiler free for for anything. That there are no spoilers about the mullet. I could use that as a, a video for just as a general video. Yeah. The, there are very minor vague spoilers where I yeah. refer to the names of events. Yeah, uh, at the end of the video. Right. But the the general point of um, we we have seen this and we see it in fiction, where we read a story, and even though those events do not match exactly events from our lives. Yeah. We recognize the pattern of those events. Right. And because of that, they create a resonance in us. We identify with it, even though, you know, I'm not a millionaire uh, or billionaire uh, tech genius with Iron Man armor, but I can, I can identify with certain aspects, say, of a, a Tony Stark Iron Man story because it, what happens in it I can make almost like an analogy to something in my life and that creates a resonance. It creates a point of connection. Yeah. And that's the power of narrative that the pattern is sometimes more important mm. than the specifics. And that's not to say you, you don't ever need the specifics, but you know, for someone who looks a lot at structure and, and how these things work, I of course like patterns and structures quite yeah, often yeah. more than I like the specifics. Well, it's a series that's rich with them. And as you pointed out in your video today, there are certain, and we're keeping this spoiler free for now, but there are certain incidents and events that you are really, you, you look back on previous books and you can see that these are very purposeful parallels and that these are themes that are being driven, that, that drive through the entire narrative, that, that that weave all of these books, each with its own pattern together. So it's really quite amazing when you think of the, the overall structure too. And I, it, one of the, the aspects of Erickson's writing that has always impressed me is this control over the patterns. Not that they become repetitive, not that it is uh, the same old, same old, not writing to oh, no. yeah. a, uh, a pattern and structure that you go, oh, I know where my A plot goes. I know where my B plot goes. At page 250, this is where I introduce this. Thing. He's not writing to that kind of structure. Right. But the idea that these events that we've seen in previous books, we get to Dust of Dreams. And there are, you know, new characters. It's a new setting. There are new things happening. People go, oh, do I have to learn new characters again? <laughs> but so much of what is in this book is the final articulation of things that we have seen before, that the through line through all of these books 
are these patterns. And when we understand the patterns, it no longer feels when we have discussed it before and we've said that it feels discontinuous. It feels that there are breaks between things that, oh, we're in one location and then now we're in another and then now there are new characters. Instead of seeing it that way, because that's looking at surface level, surface level description and the surface level detail. Right. When we understand the eddies and currents that are running under it, we suddenly realize that although they appear disparate, these are actually different views of the same pattern, the same movement, the same expression and idea. And therefore, it's not that they're discontiguous. It's not that they're not connected. It's that the connection is symbolic or thematic. Yeah. And that, I think, throws so many people because we're not trained to right. view narrative that way. That's not how modern narrative typically functions. Right. But it's and fair so to say that uh, Erickson does it very deliberately. And when we had our, our Midway Malazan discussion with him, he described how he goes about writing and he mentioned that he starts with theme. And it's something that he buries deep beneath the layers of the story, but it's there and it's underlying everything. And so it's something that he's thought through, um, which is really pretty cool actually. Yeah. yeah and, and that's the thing, the, because the theme is there underneath, it is the thing that is shaping the narrative. Yes. And I know people, people that have watched our videos, oh, they talk about theme all the time. Oh, when are they ever going to talk about the cool stuff? You go, but the theme is the cool stuff. It is the cool stuff, right? It's, I mean, the, it cool. has shaped it, it well. Okay. <laughs> sort of. We, we can try. We can, we can try to be cool, cool but let, let's face facts. We're not cool. Um, but because theme shapes the narrative, yeah. theme is what is giving it the direction. So suddenly when you go, oh, why are we over here? You go, if you recognize the pattern and the eddy and the current, it doesn't feel like you're suddenly over somewhere. You actually see it as, ah, it's a natural movement to hear because now I understand. Yeah. And to, to those people who don't enjoy that, it is perfectly fine not to enjoy that. No one is saying you have to. It's, but that is a choice that Ericsson has made. And I think when you understand that, it makes understanding and appreciating and, and following along that much easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess it's time for us to talk about themes then <laughs> because we're so cool. <laughs> so here's what to look for, folks, in this particular book. And there, it is packed. It is absolutely packed with themes that have come up before, but these are new iterations of these themes and exploring them from different angles and in different ways with a different impact, I think it's fair to say. Yeah on the reader. So uh, let's start maybe if you don't mind with the corruption of society. This is a theme that we've seen. It's a big theme in the, the Letheros books and Midnight Tides and in uh, Reaper's Gale, um, but it is something that comes up in a new way here, isn't it? But it's also a big theme in Gardens of the Moon. In Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, yep. House Gates. Like yep. society, society's perception of itself, society's perception of other societies, yeah, the feelings of exceptionalism that we apply to our own perspective, yeah, and then our lack of awareness of the fact that the other person looking back at us is doing exactly the same thing—the feeling of exceptionalism from their perspective—and they're looking at the corruption in us. Yep. And I think one of the the things that Dust of Dreams really explores are. It's, it's almost the myths that we tell ourselves about our societies yeah. and not necessarily lies, but that we are blind often to our own faults, our own flaws, because this is how it should be. This is how it's always been. Or, you know, OK, so it's not great at the minute, but it just needs a little tiny tweak. Mm -hmm. And we are unaware because we are embedded in it of of a lot of these structural issues, a lot of these, these problematic issues, and yeah. that no society is perfect. And we're so used to looking out, looking at others and seeing differences. And this is one of the, the themes that I think that Erickson plays with exceptionally in this text, where we have meetings between these different quite disparate groups 
Yep. And then we see the meetings from the different sides, depending on what is going on. So you perceive, oh, th this is a group of savages. And then they meet, you see it from the other side, them meeting maybe someone else. And they go, no, they're savages. And everyone is thinking that everyone else is the savage and that they're normal. Hmm. And it is this wonderful exploration of how we feel that our position is the normal one. Right. And everyone else is abnormal. That we are exceptional that the rules don't apply to us because we have a clear rationale for what we are doing. Right. And it shouldn't apply to them because the rules should apply to them. But it's a special case in our case. And so much of that repeats time and time again in this, in different ways, in different articulations, with different perspectives. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it, it's so true and so relevant to today, um, you know. Uh, it's there's <laughs> a lot can be said about this idea of exceptionalism um, and being more attuned to the corruption in others and people that we perceive as different from ourselves than to our own failures. Um, so yeah, it is uh, a very important theme that and, and and just to be clear, I'm not calling out oh, any no. one particular society or culture in our world. We're I'm all like, guilty. We're all guilty this, together. Yeah. This is something that we we all struggle with because we yeah. normalize our perspective because that's how we see the world. We associate and normalize then people with similar perspectives. Yeah. And then we are looking externally at other people. And quite frequently, instead of seeing similarities, because it is very difficult sometimes to see what is the same, because you don't notice what is the same. You notice the differences. Yeah. I'd, like a very simple illustration of this. Obviously, I've spent some time in the US. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the first time going over there. Um, walking into a shop and seeing the price tag on something. I was, oh, it was, I did the calculation in my head of the dollars to pounds, got the money, I counted up, went up and gave them the money. And they, they went, that's not enough. And I'm like, because the sales tax had to be added on separately. I'm going, well, yeah. why, how am I meant to know what your sales tax is? Why isn't it just included in the price? <laughs> and it was, that, it was like, this is such a dumb way to price things. Like, how am I meant to know how much something? And they go, but just work the sales sales tax out in your head i'm not from here right. how am i meant to know what it is right but that practice was entirely normal and the idea that if someone from there then came to the uk they went in and they looked at the price tag and they brought it up and they go right that and then i have to add some sort of sales tax to it so they have extra money and they're going why do you why did you get extra money I'd be, no. i would be like hey they forgot the sales tax <laughs> you know <laughs> but that, that's a very simple illustration of yeah. how something we take as routine and normal. Right. That as soon as you go somewhere else, you go, no, they do it differently. And you yeah. see the difference, even though it's just two different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah, pretty. that's a, a, a common sort of example, a little more innocent than some others, um, but uh, I think effective. So, um, and then, of course, we're talking about how... <laughs> awful people can sometimes be to other people, which leads to the theme of redemption. And it's interesting because this, again, is a theme that we have seen uh, in several of the books. And it, the exploration of redemption, I think, in Dust of Dreams, I think we agree that there might be a slightly darker view uh, that is explored in, in this particular book. Are people always redeemable? Are there things we can do that we cannot be redeemed from? Uh, you know, and are people actually worth saving? Because we are awfully destructive creatures in this world. Uh, so yeah, I think these are questions that are explored very effectively in here. And certainly one of the, the aspects, the idea of redemption, and maybe even the flip side of it, vengeance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. It, it's looking at it as a, a more holistic concept of should you be redeemed or should you be punished? Like what, what is, where is the dividing line on that? What, what is yeah. the, the approach to take? And again, like so many of the, the previous books, it is not Erickson coming down on, you must do this. It's not right. didactic in that sense. No, It's very much, while we may be able to ascertain what he uh, thinks uh, via the narrator of the series, but ultimately it is posing a question and it's posing these questions in a way to explore them from different angles. Mm -hmm. And that is a hallmark of the entire series to this point, 
because oh, yeah. we've seen redemption and compassion and forgiveness bandied around. We've seen the cost of it sometimes explored as well. And here we see, well, what if we just go for vengeance? And we've seen part of that explored earlier as well with a certain very tall character who has a singular point of view on the world. Tall to, and somewhat broad as well. Yeah. To, to hint to people who know what I'm talking about without spoiling anything. But <laughs> um, we've seen aspects of this. And here we see that these things don't always come out of nowhere, that they are built up to. Right. And also, it can be more difficult. It can be grand to say in the abstract, oh, yeah, we should do this. And then it happens to your family. Mm. Then it happens to someone you care about. Then it happens to someone that you love. Yeah. And that is the point of some of the focus here, that it removes it from the abstract. It removes it from a grand gesture. Mm. And it goes, no. What if it was someone really close to you? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And that suddenly, you, you're faced with the idea that while you might agree with something in principle, if it happened to someone you cared about or someone you loved, you go, no, that changes the equation. That's, you know, that's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, red vengeance. I got to put on a cape and a black mask and get a spotlight into the sky and take my vengeance out on the city. That as soon as it happens to someone we care about, all our it, seemingly a lot of our principles and ethics and morals go out the window because we are angry, we are hurt, we are hurt on their behalf, we are angry on their behalf. There's a different part of our brains in charge in that moment than if we are removed from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that is is part of what Erickson is exploring here. Yeah. That yeah. there are different ways to approach this. There are no right answers. It's not that here's the simple right answer. Life and circumstances are so complex. Our human interactions are so complex that you cannot go, there's just a simple, straightforward answer. That might be a guiding principle, but the actual specifics will matter. And for someone who likes structures and patterns, do you know how much it pains me to admit that the actual specifics matter? <laughs> it's tough. We all have to get over these things though. <laughs> <laughs> but it leads to really another very common Malazan theme, which is, you know, who are the bad guys, right? Uh, and there are, what Erickson does so well, and also Esselmont, is the change in perspective, like you were mentioning earlier. You know, there is a, a certain group of people that are in opposition to another group of people, but then he gives us the other group's perspective, and it completely shifts how we think about what's going on in here. And the idea that there is even a group of people that are the bad people is something that I think you can't really hold that for very long um, in the Malazan series. Uh, even when it looks like you can, there are certain moments, even in this book, in Dust of Dreams, where there are certain, uh, there's a certain group that is presented as very, very scary. And, and, you know, and, and if it were any, most other series or books or stories, they would clearly be the villains. They would clearly be this scary, bad thing out there that everybody has to watch out for. Erickson, you, you can almost bet on him complicating that, you know. <laughs> and, so. and I think that's sometimes a, a misconception because we often talk about how they are not clear-cut villains. There, there's no clear-cut, these are the bad guys. Right. There are people who do villainous things. There are right. people who are cast as villains in the series. There are people right. who we are meant to have a negative impression of. True. But the, the series doesn't simplify it to the same extent that we see in a lot of other fantasy series, particularly of the time when Erickson was writing this. Mm -hmm. And that complexity we have seen throughout the series, people who have been perceived as evil, and we come to understand their perspective and uh, potentially see that it is more complicated and more nuanced and less simple than, right. oh, they're just bad. Right. That almost everyone in this thinks of themselves as the hero of their own story. Even yeah. those characters who we absolutely despise who we have seen and we see are despicable. If you went into their head, they wouldn't think of themselves as despicable. Right. 
right. they would think of themselves, no, but I, I need to do this, or they have rationalized why they are doing this. Yep. And depending then on, on how it affects you, how it affects the people you care about, how it affects your society, your culture, how it impacts your life, that can give you a different appreciation of what is going on because we all pick different priorities. Um, I think what we see in this where people have said, oh, these villains come out of nowhere or these bad guys come out of nowhere. Again, mm -hmm. reducing it down to this idea that there's a dichotomy of good versus evil and it's going to be the good guys versus the bad guys. Right. You know, at what point in this series, even if we take the Malazans as a generic example, when have the Malazans ever been the good guys? Right. Like, think back to Gardens of the Moon. I'm not even going to mention what they do. But if you read Gardens of the Moon and came out of that thinking that Whiskey Jack and his squad were the good guys, you've misread some of what they did during that novel. Yeah, well, just the fact that they are <laughs> representatives of an inquisitive empire that you don't get to be a big empire by being nice to people handing out lollipops, right? That's my mistake. <laughs> it's not been working for you so far. Uh, I'm sorry to, to crush you. <laughs> but it's it's really something because it also does relate to the theme of compassion, which we you mentioned earlier. And also, I think the form, one of the forms it takes in this book is sacrifice. And not just any sacrifice, but the uh, concept of an unwitnessed sacrifice. So you're you're exploring not just compassion and making a sacrifice to help other people, but what about a sacrifice that nobody knows about, right? Um, and this is something that is really central. It's been set up in earlier books, obviously. If you've read the earlier books, you know what we're talking about. Um, but in the most non-spoiler way I can say, <laughs> the, the concept of, uh, of witnessing versus something happening unwitnessed. And putting it out there and the, having it happen in the world, but nobody out there knowing, you know? So it's, 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 it's central to this as well, isn't it? Yeah, because if a tree falls in the woods and doesn't hit a bull brother, did it actually fall at all? Um, <laughs> and it does, it, this is one of those, those questions that again, I don't think Erickson is trying to be polemic about, um, but, asking what is the intrinsic worth of something, mm -hmm. something like compassion. And I know people talk about compassion in this series as, oh, this series is about compassion, full stop. You know, yeah. Again, yes, in a sense, and no, that is, uh, to my mind at least, and I apologize if this sounds rude, but that is slightly reductive, uh -huh. that it, it's, it's a more complex investigation of what does compassion mean? Right. How is compassion applied? Right. In what circumstances? Is, is it always justified? Is it never justified? Where are the dividing lines? And who gets to decide them? Who is the arbiter of this? Yep. Yep. And yeah. even ahead. weighing those things up against a utilitarian good versus the, the good of the individual. Like the yeah. Those questions arise so often and are explored repeatedly throughout the series. And we see that not necessarily as a heavy focus here, but it is a continuing element that is always in the background. Absolutely. And I think another facet of it that is explored, particularly in Dust of Dreams, is compassion, sacrifice within the context of leadership because you have certain very important characters in here and more than one of the threads actually, which we can talk about when we do spoilers. There's more than one thread where Erickson I think is deliberately exploring the relationship between a leader and the people who are following that leader. And the relationship of trust that exists or doesn't between those people and the, how I think this sort of symbiosis can easily turn, and turn into a form of, of uh, a, a sort of parasitical relationship, or it, it can turn nasty when that trust is lost. And that is something you see him actively exploring in here as well, is the relationship with the, of a leader to her people, to her followers, and how does that leader establish trust and keep it, 
And what does that leader have to give up in order and, and for the, the greater good of all of these followers, you know, and it, it, it's something that's beautifully explored in here, I think. And, and again, it's the relationship between leadership and power yeah. and how do, do you utilize that power to control? Do you utilize that power to lead? Is leading different to controlling? Right. Um, do you do what your followers want because you're then enacting their desire? Or do you try to show them, here's the path that we should take? Yeah. What, what are the different aspects to leadership? What does leadership mean? Mm -hmm. What is the cost, personal or societal, right. to different styles of leadership? What is the cost of power? And how then are these structures of leader to follower, power and the power dynamics uh, as it flows down through a society or through a culture or through a tribe or through a clan? How are those structures formed? Who benefits from the structures? Why are those structures in place? Mm. Can those structures be changed? Are we amenable to change or do we fight it? Yep. And if so, why do we fight it? All of these, and I think it would be very tempting, I, I think, for a number of people, particularly given today's political climate, to do a very political reading of a lot of this and apply it as if Ericsson was commenting on things today. Right. And I, while I, I am sure you can see quite strong parallels to certain aspects, mm -hmm. that isn't obviously what Ericsson was doing. He didn't write it last year or the year before. This is about that overview, that abstract view of what are power dynamics? What are power structures? How do these things affect culture? And he was writing this when this was not the predominant concern of to interwebs. Yeah. That this was, this is something that is throughout human history. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yep. So I think that investigation will have a very modern day resonance in certain areas. But if anyone is, is sort of going, oh, it must be that, to take that step back and realize that, no, this book wasn't written yesterday, that it was written and it is looking at it in a greater historical context. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the often sacrificial nature of leadership, which we see portrayed here in several different threads, also relates to another big theme in here, which is a difficult one. It, and it is something that uh, I think is often portrayed though in, in the, the greatest literature, which is suffering. There is a lot of suffering in this book in various forms. So the suffering of innocence, particularly. There are other iterations of it in here in the form of sexual violence, which I think is something we need to sort of give readers, potential readers a heads up about. Uh, there is a, uh, and, and often I think um, you were pointing out before we started, and it's something I'd like you to talk about. A lot of this, the impact of this suffering in this book particularly, a lot of it has to do with the perspective that Erickson is exploring. Um, and you mentioned particularly, I want you to talk about the idea of victim versus per perpetrator versus witness. Um, this is something that you mentioned I'd like you to elaborate on. Um, but a lot of that impact in this book particularly, I think, and it is, it is one that I think readers who are familiar with the series will pinpoint certain incidents in this book and say this was one of the toughest things I've read. So that's, a, I think, a very important thing in here is suffering. And the perspective that Erickson explores or perspectives in relation to suffering in here. And, and it is something, I mean, uh, this book is, is kind of infamous for one particular scene. Right, and right. Uh, people get warned about it. And I think while I fully appreciate and support saying to someone, listen, there is a graphic scene of sexual violence in this novel but that's all that needs to be said because it's up to that person then to yeah. decide how they want to approach it right. there are people out there who have ptsd who are survivors of this type of violence right. who may not want to read that that is entirely their right and i am perfectly happy defending their right 
the people who build this up and say, oh, it is, and the hyperbole used for it, I don't think is ever helpful. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the one of the things I think we confuse in modern discourse about this, the inclusion of this, the inclusion of violence and sexual violence and abuse in right. any work, right? The inclusion in and of itself does not necessarily tell you anything. The perspective that is used to relay that information to us is very telling. And also authorial intent. Authorial intent plays a big part in this. And while the, the particular section in the later part of the book that people refer to, while it is graphic, while it is brutal and while it is upsetting, it shows the reader the position of victim and it shows it from the position of victim because so often in modern narrative we are voyeurs of this sort of thing we look on while this happens to someone else and there's a danger that some authors have run into where that becomes gratuitous and also where it is used almost as a form for shock value or even for titillation. What Erickson has tried to do and whether or not it works for you personally, because that is a personal decision up to you. Yeah. But I think what Erickson has tried to do is show it from the perspective of someone who is actually suffering it. Yep. And for those of us who have been lucky enough never to experience anything in the realm of this. I think it is a hugely important piece of writing because as we have so often said with literature, it allows us to explore positions that are not our own. It allows us to conceptualize and gain even a fragmentary understanding of someone else's experience. Yeah. And there is a significant difference between writing the sort of thing for shock value, for titillation value, to watch as it happens in front of you and to be in the position of victim. And another thing that Erickson explores is the perspective of the perpetrator. Yes. And that is incredibly uncomfortable. And this is something that again, is, is not pleasant putting yourself in the perspective of someone who does these things is never pleasant. It's not meant to be pleasant. It's not meant to be entertaining. But with Erickson, I think he thought it was very important to represent the impact on victims from their perspective right. and to try to understand the mentality of why someone would do this, that we, we were sold images of people who perpetrate things like this as, as if they are some sort of two-headed monster that is physically different to every other human on the planet. When in reality, the people who do these things are people who look like you and me, who look like all of us. Yeah. They are normal people. And other people in their lives will go, but that doesn't sound like them because these are not things done by strange monsters from another planet. Yep. And it's incredibly difficult to, to internalize that, to realize that, get a grasp on it and go, you know what? It, it's difficult, it's not easy, but I think it's incredibly important in literature to explore things like this in a way that if it gets too much, you close the book and walk away. We have the opportunity to mm. close the book and walk away yeah. and come back to it at a later time when we've had time away from it. People who suffer this do not have that ability to walk away. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's very important, as you said, that uh, I think Erickson does a, a, a very, very good job. And this isn't the end. Obviously, there's, a, there's another book after this. Um, so, but he does, I think, routinely explore the repercussions. And he's actually, I think it's fair to say, more interested in the repercussions than in the actual incident in some ways. Um, and so from the perspective of the victim, but as you say, there is the perspective of the perpetrator and there's a bit of a 
there, but for the grace of God, go I element to this as well, because these are human beings who do these things. I'm a human being. Am I capable? And it also relates back to the redemption uh, thing we were talking about a moment ago. Um, you know, all these things are, are, are rolled up into this. And of course, there is, there's us, the reader, um, being the witness as well, you know, to uh, these incidents where we are watching these things unfold as we read. And sometimes it is very uncomfortable. Um, but I think it is also very important that such things be witnessed because such things happen in the world inhabited by humans who do terrible things to each other often. And it is important for us to acknowledge that and that's a that's a first step, really, in, in trying to wrap our heads around this um, and dealing with it. So uh, literature performs an incredibly important role. And of course, that's not something you must do in every work of literature, but it is an important function of literature to explore these difficult things um, because we need it to do that. We yeah. need it. And, and I would reiterate, if this is not your cup of tea, um, yeah. There, there are ways to read around that section. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if it's not what you want to read, it's not why you're reading these books, then no no one is, is forcing you to, and no one should ever shame you for not reading something like this. Personally, I think it is important. And uh, Erickson's rationale for including something like this, because so routinely in our world, we look away. We yeah. don't witness so much easier to look away, right? Yeah. And for whatever reason, when he was writing this, he decided, no, I am not looking away and I am including it. It may or may not work for you personally as a reader. No one is trying to gain say that. And you may or may not think that Erickson succeeded or even failed in his intent. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, again, a judgment that you can make personally. But I think his intent was aiming for the right place, whether you think he succeeded or not. And I think it was an important attempt. And I think it's an important part of the book. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, which is really uh, an incredibly powerful book, uh, once again, and uh, leaving me on the uh, edge of my seat ready for The Crippled God. Uh, there's a, a lot of things that I can't wait to get to. Um, but before that, anything else that you want to mention in this non-spoiler video? Well, the one thing I want to probably we should have mentioned this at the start where we're talking about structure. Although I talked about, you know, a lot of this being build up. There is at the end an enormous, exciting yeah. uh, sequence yeah. that is is full of all of the uh, all of the action and everything that you want in terms of like big explosive sort of endings you just don't get a sense of closure from it and that's what i was talking about in terms of narrative structure the, the closure isn't there but there there are sequences of action there are sequences of battle there are moments of humor there but i think this is actually quite a dark book atmospherically i think this is one of the darker books in the series not in the same way that say dead house gates was uh -huh. But there is a darkness and a shadow cast over this entire novel as we feel that tension build and rise yeah. and the stakes of what is happening. But there are explosive action sequences. There are moments of um, great entertainment mm -hmm. within it. And there are moments of laughter as well. It's not Here. all doom and gloom. Yeah, but um, I, I do think it's it, it slightly dark. Uh, that's fair, I think. Um, and yes, there's humor. Yes, there are lasers and fireballs, as our friend Iskar would say. Um, so, you know, you would not expect a Malazan book not to have those things. Um, but yeah, the, I think the emphasis in this one is a perhaps a bit grimmer. Um, but keeping in mind that it is part one uh, of a two part story, in a sense, although it's also part of a 10 part story, isn't it? Uh, so there's which, all these things going which on. Which is part of what a 27 novel world 
Yeah, yeah. So all these different pieces uh, in very, it's like a, a device created by a carrier or something, you know, uh, and a bit complex at times, but it makes certain sense and there's certain beauty to it once you realize, oh, this is what's happening here. So, all right, my friend, I am very excited that we've had this discussion and perhaps I'm even more excited that I finally get to use that awesome thumbnail that I made. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be uh, coming out very soon. And everyone, please do join us uh, if you've read The uh, Dust of Dreams, or even if you're feeling bold and you haven't read it, please do join us for the spoiler-filled discussion over on A Critical Dragon. Thank you very much, AP. Thank you, Philip. All right, take care now. Bye, everyone.